please. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to, uh, and I'm grateful for uh, Professor Ricard to, to uh, giving me a chance to attend this conference. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, have a presentation about uh, interactive topological organization of vertex between vertical flow and a bundle of vertex lines. So, uh, vertex uh, or vertical region is composed of successive subplanes. Excuse me. Uh, success, uh, successive subplanes along a vertical axis. And it has been uh, very often represented by uh, using vertex tip. Uh, that is a uh, rotation of vertex field and uh, such as intense vertex T region or a set of uh, vertex T vector or a bundle of vertex T lines. Uh, vertex T line is just a line uh, which, which, is, uh, which tangential vector is the vertex T vector. So um, in, in the study of uh, vertex dynamics, uh, vertex T or vertex T line specify primary characteristics and uh, primary characteristics. And on the other, on the other hand, it has been observed for uh, from long term that uh, vertex T line sometimes uh, swirls in vertical region. And uh, it it has uh, some several types of topological feature, a uh, swirling or go straight like that. So uh, this topological, topological features of the vertex line may represent a uh, detailed vertical structure, or it may indicate uh, some kind of interactive relationships between vertical uh, flow and vertex lines. So uh, the present um, our objective is uh, the in the, uh, investigation of mechanism of the topological behavior of vertex line. And in and the investigation of interactive relationships between vertical flow and vertex lines, uh, applying uh, some physical quantity of the local topology and uh, introducing Galois invariant coordinate system associated with uh, subplane and a serial scheme or local axis geometry that specify the topology, topology or boundary of axis line in the vertical regions. So uh, first, first. Uh, we introduce some uh, topological quantities and um, define define a Galois invariant coordinate system associated with uh, vertical regions. So, uh, first, local topology of uh, of a vertex field uh, can be specified by by its gradient tensor, and since uh, it has at least one axis, that is one real eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, uh, local flow in, in a plane. Um, in, in the arbitrary plane uh, that is non parallel to Guzai A, real eigenvector, uh, can be decomposed into uh, radial and animal components. And uh, they are expressed by specific quadratic forms by these equations. So, so uh, these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvec uh, eigenvectors of the respective co quadratic forms specify the feature of azimuthal component and the radial component. So a uh, sorority um, is um, a topological quantity that is defined by the geometrical average of the eigenvalue of azimuthal component. And um, if, uh, if sorority is positive, it may indicate, it indicate the azimuthal flow has uniform direction, that is, soaring or vertical flow. And similarly, uh, source T is defined um, by the ge geometrical average of the eigenvalue of the radial component. And a vertical flow, sym uh, vertical flow symmetry is defined by the ratio of the eigenvalues, two eigenvalues of, of the um, azimuthal component. So uh, even though severity is the same, if vertical flow symmetry, symmetry changes, the, the azimuth flow feature changes. And, it's, uh, and also uh, the, the feature of, of, uh, of the radial component change according to uh, the value of vertical flow symmetry. So uh, if symmetry is low, then uh, the radial flow tend to have both inflow and outflow. And apply, uh, applying this uh, local topology or uh, sorority to velocity field, uh, it specifies a vertical region 
where the severity of the velocity is uh, positive. Then, in that case, uh, velocity gradient tensor has uh, one error eigenvalues and complex conjugate uh, eigenvalues, uh, say epsilon r plus minus i uh, phi, uh, phi v, phi v, that is severity of the velocity. And uh, its corresponding uh, eigenvectors, with a PL plus minus i, eta PL. Then for, for trajectory um, can be uh, represented by this equation. It indicates that uh, uh, the, the flow swirl uh, with the intensity of the severity of velocity uh, in, the, in, in the plane defined by the PL and eta PL. So the plane is defined by, uh, by the PL and eta PL. And, and with swirling, it converges or diverges according to the sign or intensity of epsilon r. That's just equal to um, arithmetic, average, uh, arithmetic average of eigenvalues of the radial component. And for also proceed or converge um, along uh, the uh, real, real eigenvectors. And now uh, we can define a vertex space that is a government invariant coordinate system associated with soil plan, where uh, also normal bases are parallel to the PL, eta PL, and their normal vectors. And in the vortex space, velocity gradient tensor can be expressed by invariant, uh, comp uh, invariant components by these equations. So, um, so velocity gradient com components are expressed by uh, eigenvalues or uh, eigenvalues or uh, vorticity, vorticity component parallel to uh, the PL or eta PL. And um, also we have to um, specify the topology of axis line or vorticity lines. So if we apply a local topology to vorticity vector, uh, uh, which is specified by, by the gradient tensor or the vorticity vector, but uh, it does not, uh, it, it can specify the particular feature of vorticity line, but it cannot, uh, but it is not associated with vort uh, vertical region or soil plane. Then we have, excuse me. Then we have, we have a linear transformation of, of, the, gradient, uh, of the gradient tensor into that in the vort uh, vortex space. And then also, we define a block matrix of, of, the, uh, of the gradient tensor in the vortex space associated with a soil plane. Then if we, um, if we estimate severity or softy in this block matrix, uh, it can specify soaring feature or inflow or outflow feature in the soil plane. In the next, uh, we, we formulate a vortex space, uh, vortex stretching in the vortex space. A, vo a vortex equation can be derived from operating rotation to the Nagas Stokes equation. And the vortex stretching can be expressed by, by this term, where S, uh, S denotes the rate of a strain tensor. And in the vortex space, the rate of strain tensor can be uh, expressed by, by these terms. And uh, it, and the uh, stretch, uh, the st stretching term s omega, uh, s omega can be expressed by these equations. Uh, this is very uh, interesting, interesting, re um, interesting results because rate of strain tensor is unitary matrix. But however, the effect of the vortex stretching rotates um, uh, vortex state vector by this non-diagonal terms. And um, it is also interesting that, excuse me, the swirling feature of the velocity gradient tensor and the uh, swirling feature of the vertical stretching is just the same. It has the same value of, um, of the swirling. However, um, velocity gradient tensor rotates the flow clockwise However, uh, vortex stretching rotate uh, swirls uh, vortex vector counterclockwise in the vertical region. So now uh, we investigate mechanism, mechanisms of, uh, of the topological, fe topological feature of vortex T lines 
uh, using uh, some examples in of the uh, of the volatility line uh, uh, in the homogeneous isotropic turbulence analyzed in the direct numerical simulations, where uh, the Taylor Reynolds number is low, is low, and the bundle of volatility line is uh, is identified in the core uh, region of vertices, uh, where the intermediate Hessian of stability of the velocity is is just uh, is just uh, ne negative. Okay, first, th this figure shows an um, example of a vertical region re represented by the contour of the solidity of velocity and, uh, and uh, one bundle of the velocity lines passing through the core region of the vertex. And uh, the, the, uh, the color of the contour of the vertice line shows uh, the solidity of vertice lines. So uh, since uh, it's in, in the most part, it has a red, uh, it has red, uh, red regions. So in the most part, um, vorticity line swirl. And this figure shows uh, the joint probability density function of the severity of vorticity line and the severity of velocity. So uh, it indicates that irrespective of intensity of swirling of velocity, uh, about, ha uh, about half uh, the region of the vortex, uh, half region of of the vortices, uh, both the line swirls. And next, uh, we analyze the direction of um, direction of the swirling of the vorticity lines. So uh, this time, uh, this time indicate uh, rotation direction of vorticity vector or vorticity line in the swirl plane, which can be um, which can be specified the the vorticity of vorticity of vertical uh, vorticity of vorticity vector in 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 the vortex space. So the the third component in, in the vortex uh, of the vortex of the the third component of the vorticity of a vortex Vorticity vector in the cell plane indicates just the uh, just the direction of a rotation in the cell plane. So uh, this figure shows that um, vorticity line can uh, can swirl both uh, clockwise and counterclockwise, even though vortex stretching effect uh, swirls counterclockwise only. It's very strange. So. Uh, we uh, we clarify this mechanism. First, we uh, we localize the the vortex vector in the vortex space, and then uh, and also decompose uh, vortex vector in, into radial and animal component component and uh, and normal vector normal component to 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 solve plan. So and then um, it is noted that um, the uh, rate of strain tensor in the vortex uh, vor vortex stretching swirls uh, component almost uh, orthogonal, orthogonal, counterclockwise. And then um, the radial component uh, just uh, determine the swirling direction. So this uh, this figure explains this uh, this mechanisms. Uh, this figure shows uh, one uh, vortice vector field in a soil plane and the decomposed radial and atmosphere components. And, uh, and, and this figure shows a vortex stretching effect of the radial and atmosphere component. So it it's in, it's, it's indicates uh, when, when radial component has completely outflow, outflow features, then it has a vortex stretching effect to swirl counterclockwise. And on the other hand, this figure shows uh, the, um, another example of a vortice vector in a cell plane and uh, decomposed uh, radial and atmosphere components, where uh, the, the radial component has complete inflow. And if it has complete into inflow, it has a vortex stretching effect to swirl, to, to, uh, to swirl clockwise. So uh, this result shows that uh, clearly that the the radial components 
uh, the st uh, stretching effect of the radial component determining the sward direction of the uh, of the vertical lines. So then, so then uh, we may wonder how uh, the feature of the radial component in flow or out flow can be determined. Yes, it is. Uh, it can be clarified by the the local radial component of the vertices vectors. So when we localize uh, the vertices component, the the radial component is just given by uh, quadratic forms of the matrix. Um, described here. And then uh, in the vortex space, these uh, components can be uh, expressed by, by, by this form. So uh, non-diagonal non -diagonal component becomes zero, and the diag diagonal component is expressed by derivative of eigenvalues of the radial com uh, azimuthal component of vertical flow. With respect to with respect to normal direction to the slope plane. So if if vortex developed upward, and then this component has positive values, then the radial component of vort uh, vortex vector has complete uh, a complete outflow. Then it has a vortex stretching effect to swirl counterclockwise. And on the other hand, if vortex de uh, decayed upward, and then this uh, component become negative, so uh, the, ra uh, the radial component of vort uh, vortex vector has complete inflow and has a uh, vortex, vortex stretching effect to swirl clockwise. So uh, the, the so vortex line swirl according to decay or development of the severity of the vortex. So uh, this figure shows uh, two examples of, of two vertical region where uh, vertical flow swirls uh, um, clockwise, and on, on the other hand, um, uh, vertical vector uh, swirl, swirl counterclockwise because um, because because uh, vortex or swirling uh, swirling developed upward upward, and uh, and in this case uh, because um, Swirling, swirling decayed upward, and so uh, vertical flow swirls clockwise. And this figure shows a uh, joint probability density function of uh, the, the, the direction of swirling of vortex T line and swirling uh, of, of vortex T lines. So this uh, JPDF, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, in, in this figure, it, this is, uh, this, this this uh, JPDF is is given in the condition uh, to have a uh, complete outflow and development severity over the velocity, and and uh, and this figure uh, indicate in the condition that uh, radial component has complete inflow and uh, swelling decays. So this two, uh, JPDF shows clearly these features. So. Uh, we uh, we show that uh, the vertical uh, the vertical flow in the soil plane specifies a first topology of vortex vector and vortex stretching characteristics. So uh, vortex lines uh, are just lines are just dependent on vertical flow. But uh, however, a vertical flow has uh, also uh, flow normal normal to the soil plane. That the actual flow. So we may wonder is the characteristic characteristic of the actual flow arbitrary. But this figure shows uh, just one uh, vertical region and uh, the vertical flow swirl clockwise in the swirl plane, and uh, in the parallel planes, a vertical flow exists, of course. But however, in here, a vertical flow has a somewhat uh, upward component, and here uh, in this plane, a vertical flow has a com uh, has a component to uh, co component backward, downward. Excuse me. Downward, and uh, if if it has a 
upward component, uh, vortex, vortex design is swirls clockwise, and uh, its vertical flow has a downward component, vortex design swirls swirl counterclockwise. counterclockwise. So um, we, we, we clarify this uh, mechanism. We, uh, we relied again uh, the uh, vertical gradient tensor in the vortex space. And then uh, it shows that uh, the, the normal component, actual flow component, uh, the, the derivative of this component with respect to uh, the direction parallel to the slope plane is zero. So uh, the, second, uh, the second derivative of the normal component is just important to characteristics of the actual flow. And then uh, in, in incompressible flow, where uh, the, uh, the divergence of the uh, divergence of velocity is zero, we can derive the equation. Um, th this equation that um, the rotating the rotating direction of, of the velocity line in the soil frame is just equal to minus Laplacian of the normal component. And then if uh, in the Laplacian, the, the Laplacian in the third plane is dominant, and then, uh, then the Laplacian uh, of a uh, normal component in the third plane, so plane specify, uh, is specified by the direction, rotating direction of vorticity lines. So uh, this, uh, this equation shows that if uh, if uh, vorticity line swir swirls clockwise, and then um, the Laplacian of normal component in the soil plane is positive, so then if it has it ha it has upward axial flow, and then uh, if it has uh, a vorticity line swirl counterclockwise, so uh, a normal component has downward axial flow. So this figure shows, okay, uh, some uh, some vertical flow in several five planes and um, uh, and, and the vortex vector in 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 this plane and, and the Laplacian of, of of the normal component or rotational component of, of the vortex lines. So it's uh, it's clearly shows that if uh, it rotate clockwise, it has up, upward upward uh, axial flow. And if uh, vortex lines were counterclockwise, so uh, it has it has downward axial flow. So th like this. So uh, if 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 uh, vortex line uh, loaded counterclockwise, it's a downward uh, axial flow. So you have just under two minutes. Okay. 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 So. So, uh, so vortex design is uh, it has been applied to indicate intensity of uh, of rotating of a vortex, but actually it represents topological dynamics of vertical flow along the vertical region, and it can twist or clockwise or counterclockwise according according to development or decay or soaring flow, and and, and not only this, um, vortex design generate actual flow, so. Vortex line influence vertical flow structures. So it has, uh, so vertical flow and vortex line has a kind of interactive uh, organization systems. Okay, so, um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, the, the, the time, uh, we, we have no time. So, uh, in uh, the conclusion, vortex vector field is structured by vertical flow in continuous flow plans, and the vertical stretching effect, the uh, effect, uh, and vertical, vertical stretching effect, that's for the vortex lines. And the bundle of vertex lines represent topological dynamics of vertical flow along vertical regions. And, uh, and and also soaring of vortex line generate actual flow in the soil plane. So uh, vortex may have an interactive organization system between vertical flow and vortex lines. 
Okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. Hi, thank you for uh, an interesting talk. Can I ask uh, a point of clarification? The measures that you introduced in your talk, do you use these to identify vortex tubes in simulations or do you find the vortex tubes first and then just use them to analyze them? OK, did, did you did you hear what I said? Did you understand? Not, not, oh, oh, no, Rafi, not can, I, can I ask the measures that you uh, showed us today, no. do you use these to identify the locations of vortex tubes in simulations or do you have them already, uh, the locations already, and then you use them to uh, just just to study the uh, dynamics? Um, in, in this turbulence, uh, the, the vertical region is analyzed uh, or identified using solidity of velocity field. Okay, yeah. my, my, the follow up then is Are you sure these measures are objective? Uh, because I mean, uh, that could, it could lead to, lead to the misidentifications of things. I mean, do you get some regions where? Yeah. It gives you the measure which you would think oh, this is a vortex tube, but it isn't really. Yeah. That's that's the case. Yes. Um, uh, it may not uh, the uh, the good answer to your question, but however, uh, the, the, there are several several way to identify uh, identify vortex because we have no um, um, unified vortex definitions. But however, in, in this isotropic homogeneous turbulence, um, mm -hmm. ident uh, identified vortices uh, using, uh, for example, solidity or uh, the second invariant of vertical ground and tensile or uh, lambda 2 definition uh, is, is, is uh, almost the same uh, because uh, this is due to uh, the, the vortex uh, behavior in this turbulence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and even though, of course, if uh, if we identify the intense vorticity region, is the the the, the uh, identified result is almost the same. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So I'll ask one quick question. Which is that um, at least the th the what I took from the analysis that you presented, things were mostly local analysis, in particular sort of um, bundles of vortex lines, and I wondered whether there was also a global counterpart to the analysis that you were doing. I I I I, I couldn't understand the Maybe maybe it's I can I can add. Uh, what does it mean local topology? Yes, topology. You mean you're asking me, or you're asking? Uh, we, uh, yes, uh, it it applies uh, on topological quantity, uh, topological quantity uh, in terms of local flow. But however, uh, by by um, uh, yes, by analyzing the 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 distribution of of, uh, of of the uh, local topology quantities, we can uh, we can analyze uh, the, the the global topological features like vorticity. Okay, let's thank Katsuki again for a great talk.
Okay, our final talk this evening will be from Simone Zucher, who will tell us about quantum knots and minimal surfaces. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I know, Renzo, you're tired of hearing this, but uh, I really must thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here, really. Um, by the way, you see that Renzo is uh, a co-author of this work. So. Um, so we'll be talking about evolution of quantum knots driven by minimal surfaces. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, a movie uh, of a work of 30 years ago. So this is water. And as you saw, there are two rings. OK, you see them. They have a head on collision. And uh, from this collision, you see uh, the production of uh, small rings that travel radially. And uh, you see all these threads and bridges, and this gives you the idea of how complex uh, uh, classical turbulence is in viscous fluids. Um, for this reason, uh, those who are interested in studying turbulence uh, prefer to play with quantum turbulence. And here, uh, the model underneath is the gross pitayevsky equation. And uh, I reproduced the head-on collision <clears throat> of these two perturbed rings. Uh, of course, I have to perturb uh, uh, manually. I, I mean, uh, the initial condition uh, must be perturbed. Otherwise, uh, if you have just normal rings, they will enlarge, they will slow down, and then they will fade away. In order to have the production of these uh, small rings, you need to, to engineer the initial condition, I would say. So I will spend the rest of, of my talk uh, trying to explain how we got here. Um, so I will say a few words about the gross pitayevsky equation, which we have already seen uh, these days. Uh, I will show you some movies uh, about the dynamics of some defects. Uh, we'll try to get some evolutionary scenarios from there. And then uh, I will show you some uh, topological quantities like right, twist, and so on. And then we'll link the dynamics of these uh, 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 vortices to minimal surfaces. So, gross pitayevsky equation, as I said, uh, you have already seen it. Uh, this is its form. By modeling transformations, um, you know that uh, you can write in terms of density of a classical fluid and uh, velocity, which is the gradient of the phase. Um, as I said, it's much easier to analyze uh, in turbulence in quantum context because uh, it's localized, uh, vorticity is localized on the defects. Um, we're interested in dark structures, which means that for us, uh, uh, the density goes to infinity and goes to one as uh, you go to infinity. And so uh, we know that if you use a spectral approach based on the fast Fourier transform, which is obviously very efficient, you need a periodic box. And uh, if your initial condition is not periodic, you need to, you need to mirror your initial condition in all directions. And so you end up uh, with uh, eight times your original degree of freedom. Um, and this might require a lot of memory and might become uh, a, a huge problem. And so we had an idea um, just a few years ago, uh, which was to rescale the uh, R3 domain into minus one, one. Uh, to the third uh, through a simple transformation, and uh, with this idea, we can we can impose our initial uh, our uh, boundary conditions at infinity without uh, uh, truncating the domain, basically. So uh, the gross pitayevsky equation becomes this one, and then uh, we solve in a very efficient way um, by uh, strength uh, strength um, time splitting, and uh, we use. Uh, fourth order finite difference in space. And then, as I said, in time, we use this method. And uh, it's splitting. So we, we solve the, <clears throat> we have an efficient approximation of the matrix exponential for the linear part. And then uh, the nonlinear part is solved exactly. Um, just a few words about the initial condition. Uh, we know very well how to uh, impose an initial straight vortex, which, by the way, is the only time-independent solution of the gross pitayevsky equation. So if you write a new code and you want to test your code, you just put this straight vortex. And if it stays there for days, then it means that your code is good. 
if it moves, there's something wrong. Um, it's not the real straight vortex. Okay. Then there is another structure, which is the vortex ring, which man maintain its uh, shape. So it's a self-preserving self structure, which travels at constant speed. So uh, it becomes itself in a moving reference frame. But so we know exactly how to deal with these two simple initial conditions. The problem is if you have an arbitrary initial condition like a trefoil knot, how do you generate uh, the initial psi? Uh, well, one idea is given the 3D curve, by the bios our integral, you compute the velocity field, which is time consuming, but at least you have a velocity field. Then you integrate that to get the phase and you have to be careful, uh, it's defined up to a constant. So you set, for instance, uh, the phase zero somewhere in the bike of the domain. And then from there, you integrate, making sure to stay away from uh, vortex defects, because then you have to end your integration either on the vortex defects or at infinity. And then uh, we assign the density according to the fourth order, but the approximation of a straight vortex. Um, so, I show you some dynamics. This is clearly uh, a torus knot. As you can see, <clears throat> there's the form. Uh, okay, now we, we start again. So, uh, we start from the torus knot. Due to the perfect symmetry of the knot, there are instant nine instantaneous reconnections that uh, produce that blue ring. And then uh, the secondary coiled ring, because of the same symmetries, uh, generates nine small rings that uh, then move. So this is one. Uh, this one is made of three mutually orthogonal rings. And you see, first of all, the formation of two rings. You see it again. Okay, two rings, then just one loop, uh, then two, and then three again. So it reminds us of a cycle. And uh, here we started from two ellipses. This is more interesting because you start from unknotted and unlinked uh, simple geometries. And for a, for a while, you see a hopeful link. Okay, now, okay, this is the hopeful link. And then it goes back to simple geometry. Uh, this reminds of us of a cycle as well. And then I think the most interesting is this one where, uh, well, it's very fast. I should slow it down. Um, where you see, we start from perturbed rings, very perturbed. And uh, you see the formation of one loop and then of a trefoil knot, actually. It's more complicated. Simple loop, hopeful loop, link, trefoil knot. So this is a very interesting, um, we call it inverse cascade, but uh, we'll see it later. So now uh, let's try to classify these scenarios. I didn't show you this movie, but uh, you start from a hopeful link and then uh, you get a single unknotted loop, and uh, uh, and then from there you get two uh, single loops. So this is precisely what uh, he showed us this morning. So um, it's a direct topological cascade of the Hopf link, um, and this is one scenario. The same scenario, um, we put them together, and we call it collapse. For us, collapse is uh, when there are instantaneous reconnections. So the topology changes instantaneously. And this happens only if you have very high symmetry, which in nature, of course, you don't have, but in a numerical simulation, you can. And so, uh, as you saw in the movie earlier, you have these perturbed rings. They enlarge as they, as they approach each other, they slow down. And because of the perfect symmetry, they reconnect at uh, precise points. And uh, they give rise of this uh, uh, radially moving small rings. Uh, so this is an example of a topological collapse. 
Um, this is another, this is the Torus uh, knot 29. This is another example of a collapse because you have very high symmetry in, in the initial condition, and then instantaneously uh, a small ring, the blue one, is formed. The, the lighter one is very coiled, but as I said, it's uh, perfectly symmetric. So at the same time, you have the production of nine rings, and then these rings uh, move away. Um, and uh, this was the uh, three mutually orthogonal rings. Uh, these are three rings um, originated by uh, self-preserving self rings. So we use that idea. And uh, this reminds, as I said earlier, uh, uh, of, it, it reminds us of a cycle, structural cycle, because um, you start from three um, loops, unknotted and unlinked, and then you have the formation of two loops, then a single one, which is very long, and then from there you go back to two, and then again three. So it's a cycle. And uh, this one, um, which is again a cycle, but it is a topological cycle because you start from two ellipses. And uh, so a very simple, I mean, there are two planar uh, curves, unlinked and unknotted. And uh, from there, you get for a while a hope link. So there's a change in topology. But then again, you go back to uh, two unlinked loops. And finally, uh, this is something that uh, maybe it's hard to see because we usually see the inverse. And in fact, we call it inverse topological cascade because you usually see something like this. Whereas we started from two, as I said, very perturbed rings. And then for a while you have the formation of a single loop. Um, and then a hopeful link. So there's a change in topology every time, but the complexity is increasing. And actually in the end, we get the production of a threadful knot. So uh, as far as we know, this is the first realization of a topologically non-trivial knot, the threadful knot, starting from very trivial initial conditions. So um, we think this is one of the main results. <clears throat> now about uh, topological quantum hydrodynamics, well, you already seen this this morning, so you know that the uh, circulation is quantized, quantized, and uh, the helicity is defined as the dot product between the velocity field and the vorticity field. And uh, because vorticity is singular and on uh, vortex lines, you get that the helicity, uh, if you do the computation, is uh, zero. So you have this zero helicity condition. And uh, as uh, the width showed us this morning, um, you can write elicity in this way, the summation on all vortex lines of the self-linking number times uh, its circulation plus uh, the summation of linking numbers. And uh, so uh, what I did was to uh, take these four cases. Uh, I mean, I did for many other cases, but I will show you just these plots. And uh, for instance, if you take that knot, uh, it evolves in time, and at every time step, I go and look for the vortex center line uh, in order to have a 3D curve, which might be smooth enough to compute at least the first and second derivative. And uh, then I need to compute the ribbon because you know the twist is defined only through a ribbon, otherwise you cannot compute it. And uh, by doing so, uh, I can compute right, twist, linking number, and then uh, helicity as the summation of all of them. So what we see here, uh, uh, try to concentrate on the red squares, okay? Uh, whose scale is on the left? That's the length of the, the total length of the defects. And it's clear that uh, when, and the dot point, the dots that you see here, where the time is, is uh, the time of reconnections. And uh, you have over there the, the torus knot, the three rings, the two ellipses, 
and the <clears throat> two perturbed uh, rings. Uh, a constant characteristic is that the length has a maximum uh, at reconnection time. Plus, uh, there's an asymmetry, and you can see that uh, after reconnection, the length decreases very quickly. So its derivative is higher in absolute value than before reconnection. And this is a, it's a fact that is already known, and uh, it's due to sound emission. So for this reason, uh, reconnections are uh, irreversible somehow. And then uh, uh, on the, the color plots um, are curvatures, since there are many um, loops, uh, you have different colors. And you can see that through reconnections, there is a jump in the curvature, obviously. Mm. Here, I know it's hard to see, but again, concentrate on the red squares uh, because that's helicity. And as you can see, helicity is always constant and equal to zero. Of course, there are some errors uh, uh, here in that plot, but uh, there are no because you can think that uh, it's how I mean somehow it's difficult to get a smooth curve to to do the computation of right twists and so on. So um, that's just numerical uh, errors due to the analysis, I would say. Now, um, as you can see in the first two cases, um, the rest of the plot is made of what circles, which you cannot identify in that plot. Uh, represent right and uh, diamonds uh, twist, you can see that they compensate perfectly for each other. For instance, uh, I don't know which one is which, but this one, this curve is perfectly compensated by this one to give zero. And when another loop starts, the blue one, the sum is zero. So felicity is zero. The same thing happens uh, here where uh, you get a compensation of all right and twist. And so uh, again, your sum is zero. Now here with the two ellipses, uh, at the beginning, everything seems to go as expected. But then if you do the summation of right and twist, it's easy for you to do by eye, you get an average of 0 0.0, minus 0 0.5. And uh, as we saw earlier this morning, if you multiply by two the linking number, you get minus one. So uh, if you do the summation of twist, uh, right, and linking number to get the elicity, you end up with zero elicity. So I would, and, and the same is for the two perturbed rings. So I would say that uh, uh, the zero elicity condition is confirmed, so the wheat might be you know, quiet that uh, we found a confirmation of what you showed uh, this morning. And uh, there is a progressive decade of right, which is uh, uh, a signature of uh, a relaxing. Does it work? As long as it doesn't, yeah. Um, so as I was saying that right is uh, uh, going down as a signature of relaxation towards uh, unlinked rings. And now we talk about uh, energy. Um, this is the way to compute energy for the gross pitayevsky equation uh, by modern transformation. Uh, you can divide in four contributions, uh, which are more classical because you have kinetic energy. This new uh, guy, which is quantum, we, we call quantum energy. And then you have potential energy and internal uh, or interaction energy. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, if the density is almost constant, uh, this happens uh, uh, just outside the vortex tubes where density reaches the value of one quite quickly. Uh, the last two parts are just a constant contribution. And so where there is a gradient of the density, uh, kinetic and quantum energy play a bigger role. Um, now, 
what's the link between that and uh, minimal surfaces? There on the left, uh, we have the Hopf link, and uh, uh, that is uh, the surface of minimal area, um, which is a nice of phase surface. Okay, so uh, I take all possible isophases surfaces, uh, which are safer surfaces connecting these two links, uh, these two vortices, and I compute their areas, and then uh, I find the minimum of this uh, area as a function of uh, uh, the value of theta. And uh, so now, if you consider um, neglecting a small region around the vortex uh, where density changes very quickly, you end up with a region which we call S prime minimum, which is the part of the minimum surface where density is almost constant. Then we know that from continuity equation, if density is almost constant, then the, the, the vector, um, the velocity field is divergence free. And uh, since u is the gradient of the phase, you end up having the Laplacian of the phase equal to zero. Uh, but since we're looking at isophase surfaces, this means that uh, uh, S prime mean, which is the that part of the minimal surface where rho is almost constant, is harmonic. And therefore, um, is critical with respect to the Dirichlet functional defined in this way. If you go and look at the Dirichlet functional uh, where you substitute psi, uh, you end up noticing that uh, it's made of the two contribution, which are the kinetic energy and the quantum energy. The only difference with what we saw before is that this is an integral on the surface. It's not on the volume. So this is a uh, 2D integral over a particular surface. And uh, we call this, uh, uh, sorry, this is not a vector, it's a scalar, of course. And um, I use this mathematical symbol to identify the integral on the surface. And um, so this is just a plot to show you that in the four cases that uh, I showed you earlier, um, the area, the minimal area changes and uh, in the first case of the uh, torus knot, it decreases almost monotonically. For the three rings, there's a maximum in this minimum area when you have a very long loop. And then also there you have a maximum uh, for a certain particular configuration. And whereas here, which is uh, an inverse topological uh, configuration, I would say cascade, you have something that changes in time. But in any case, there's definitely a link between uh, the minimum surface and uh, um, that functional, which measures the energy. Because what I reported here is in blue, uh, just focus on the main plots. In blue, I reported that functional, which is the sum of kinetic and uh, um, quantum energy. Maximum means what? That uh, for different surfaces, I computed that functional, and uh, and then I looked at a specific time for the maximum of that functional. So max d of psi is that maximum. Whereas in uh, for theta, the change is between zero and two pi. So we have to make a lot of computations in the integrals. Okay. Um, whereas the other one is that the same functional but computed on a specific uh, isophase surface, which is the one of minimal minimum area, um, and it's the red plot. And as you can see, they almost overlap every everywhere, so they coincide. And this means that indeed the um, the minimum surface is critical for um, for the functional. So. These are the conclusions. Uh, we ran uh, direct numerical simulations of the GPE uh, using a new code that resolving the problem about a truncated domain. We identified three possible scenarios, direct cascade and collapse, structure and topological cycles, and the inverse cascade. The last one is to us the most important because we showed that it's possible to generate 
a more complex structure that hopefully not starting from very simple unknotted loops. We confirmed both the time symmetry, which was already known, and the zero elicity theorem. And then uh, we saw this link between uh, uh, the dynamics of the uh, these uh, defects and the minimal, minimum area. And these are just the references for this work. So thank you very much for being here. Oh, very nice. I, I have two questions. Uh, one is in the evolutions which you have um, uh, shown to us, uh, typically, how much uh, is the um, compressible kinetic energy compared to the incompressible kinetic energy? Um, so, um, essentially, have the vortices lost much kinetic, incompressible kinetic energy into sound or just a small fraction? And the second question is with your stretch variables, how do you conserve the energy? Um, if you have a wave packet moving away from reconnections or whatever accelerations of the vortices, uh, as you move away, then you, you become unable to uh, compute the gradient square, which is the function of um, the kinetic energy. So essentially, you're shunting away the very sh short length scales. Correct? It is, it is as if for a, at infinity, yeah, I mean, the answer is very simple because the integrals, all the integrals that you saw are made on surfaces and uh, these surfaces are very small. They don't go up to infinity. So, um, I mean, I didn't need to compute the gradients and so on far away from the from the defects because, as I showed you earlier, the this, in, I mean, this is in principle the energy, but I didn't compute the integral, the volume integral. I computed the surface integral because anything I needed was this, basically, this part. Okay, so uh, I could compute these gradients without any problem because the code that we used has a, a very fine grid in the proximity of the origin and so that's where all the defects lie for a long time so that was not a problem and to answer your first question um, which if i remember correctly was what is the the weight of the uh, compressible energy with respect to the classical one well i remember i did all these plots but right now i i mean uh, uh, because the Mm, the main difference is localized close to the vortex lines where the gradients of the density is larger. So you, you see compressible effects. Uh, to tell you the truth right now, I don't remember the exact numbers and I don't have the plots here, but uh, I don't think, I mean, the, the behavior, I can say that, the behavior was more or less the same. I mean, um, I didn't see very strange things, okay? Uh, but the relative percentage, uh, I don't remember. But for sure it was localized around the vortex defects. And then, because I think you are interested in sound emission and these kind of things, I really didn't check that, so I have no idea. Because I didn't do any integral over the whole domain. I was concentrated only on integrate stuff energy on the surfaces. Okay. 